Okay, so in this video, we're actually going to look a little bit deeper into the structure of constructors and what's really happening behind the scenes when we call a constructor. So just as a refresher, uh, what's happening here is we're declaring the person Harry, we're giving him two arguments, he's running with a two argument constructor, and when we call, you know, when we instantiate Sally, we're running her with a zero argument constructor. And everything is still fine as we can see over here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to write a constructor for account. So what we'd need to do is say, well, account, we can give account three variables. We can give it a string, a name, uh, int, an age, and an int, my cache. And what we can do is we can say, well, the client should be equal to person at a name and an age. So we're calling the two argument constructor to instantiate what the client should be. And the second thing would be, well, the same thing for cache, except this is a lot easier since we're given the argument in the first place. So let's, uh, we can just take these away and we can take that away too. And let's initialize an account. Let's just initialize account Harry, and we need to give him these three arguments. So we can say Harry, he's 40 years old, he has $400 in the bank. So I can make this, and what happens? The zero argument constructor runs, and the two argument constructor runs. But this really doesn't make any sense. I mean, over here, when I specified this constructor, Nowhere in this constructor am I calling a one argument or sorry a zero argument constructor. I'm only ever calling a two argument constructor, which leads us to wonder where is the zero argument constructor coming in from. Now this is where we require a bit of C++ technical knowledge, but essentially what happens in a constructor's sort of runtime is first the member initialization list runs and then the body of the constructor runs. The body is in between these two braces and the member initialization list actually goes after the parameter list and before the body. So since we haven't specified anything in the member initialization list, uh, the default constructor, the zero argument or the default constructor for a person ran simply because it's a member in our structure. So the default constructor for you know, an integer also ran, but because we never specified a constructor that prints out something for an integer when it's defaultly constructed, it never printed anything there. So what we're going to do is we're going to change this a little bit to figure out can we make that person zero argument constructor go away? Because think about it, we're initializing client in two different ways, and this is really inefficient. After all, every time I uh, initialize an account, I don't want a person constructor to run twice. That's just a big waste of resources. So the, the sort of syntax that we're dealing with here is going to be a semicolon, and then you can take each of your members. So for instance, I'm just gonna hit the line here and initialize my members like this. The first one, well, client, you're going to initialize this in the same way that you initialize a person, let's say Harry. Um, so we would go, well, the name is going to be a name, and the age is going to be an age. And you put a comma after every sort of initialization. Then the second thing is our cache. So our cache can be initialized to my cache. After this, well, there's nothing else to initialize. Don't put any commas. You can just leave the constructor here. So now that we've already initialized this, we don't need to run this in the constructor body. So we can delete these two lines. And our function looks a bit shorter, at least in the function body. And just to be sure that it's actually running, we can maybe say, you know, cout uh, account ctor ran. And let's try seeing what happens now feel like I may have made a mistake somewhere where client a name an age cache my cache cout account ctor ran 
Mm. Oh, sorry about that. These kinds of things happen. So let's make this again. And here we notice that just the two argument constructor runs. The zero argument constructor does not run. And the account constructor ran. So it might, you know, be kind of weird that the account constructor is running after the person to argument constructor is running. But this really shouldn't come as a surprise. After all, we know that whatever happens in this member initialization list happens before the body of the function is executed. So when we declared this, when we instantiated this object, C++ went, okay, first let me do whatever's in the initialization list. So it went into the member initialization list, uh, which we specified by demarking a semicolon after the um, parameter list. It went, okay, I will initialize client by using the two argument constructor from person, and I will initialize cache because this is how you can initialize integer values. And inside of the body, now this is when I run. So this ran first, it printed out the two argument constructor ran, and then this ran after that, the body ran after. Now, you might be wondering, well, why the heck is there an initialization list in the first place? Why not just do everything in the body? This is because in several, uh, let's say, there was a const int id. Every account now has an id. Well, you, can, you can't actually assign a value to an id. For instance, if I try to do something like id equals uh, let's see, given id, and I can make a fourth parameter here, uh, int given, hmm, uh, let's just say my id, mid, whatever. Anyways, the point is, if I try to create a, a, a constructor where I'm assigning a value to a constant member, C++ is going to complain. It says you can't actually initialize that, and it's also complaining because I haven't given it four arguments. So let's give it four arguments. And it's saying, okay, in the constructor, an uninitialized member ID with const, um, y you can't assign to it. So the only way we can actually give it a value is in the initialization list. So if we take this out, and in the initialization list over here, we put in id to be my id, then C++ will be fine. It won't care, and everything works just as we need it to. So the initialization list serves two purposes. One, it creates space and calls the default constructor for whatever objects are members for the class. The second is that it allows us to uh, initialize values that are somewhat difficult to initialize for structures. For instance, constant values, and if you guys know about this, references. References are also somewhat um, dependent on initialization lists to be properly um, instantiated inside of an object. So there you have it. And then you might be wondering, well, why then do we even have a body? After all, you can do everything in the initialization list. Here's the thing, you can't actually do everything. For instance, you might want to allocate memory and assign something into the heap to a certain pointer. Uh, technically, you can still do this in the initialization list, but in this case, it wouldn't actually matter since you can do this in the constructor body. Um, the other thing might be, if you're going to be initializing an array, a dynamically sized array, this has to actually be done in the constructor body since it's really difficult and also somewhat illegible uh, to do this in the member initialization list. I'm not actually sure if it's possible to. That's going a bit deep into uh, whatever C++ style and guidelines are in. And lastly, of course, in the member initialization list, it might just look a little bit more um, streamlined. You're initializing and allocating space for these at the same time on the stack. And when you're calling the default constructors for each of these member variables, you're not doing any overhead work. You're streamlining the process by calling the constructors on the arguments you want to call them on. So 
we're not doing you know double the constructor work we're not calling both constructors we're calling just one of them so for those reasons we have a member initialization list and as you can see it's pretty for instance when we look at this initialization for an account Harry it's clean like if you look back to say one or two tutorials before um, it's a lot cleaner than doing something that involved putting brackets that looked something like this and then an extra set of brackets that did this and in fact I'm not even sure if this would work see it just doesn't work uh, simply because we haven't defined constructors to work that way for these kinds of initializations but that doesn't matter because the way that we have defined constructors is more intuitive than having to initialize them in the other uh, curly braces kind of method. So if we do this, everything works out fine. Everything is in a streamlined process. Classes can be compounded and not be running uh, overhead and everything works. So. This was a basics of the constructor, what happens behind the constructor when it runs. Um, and I think there is one thing I forgot to mention. Inside the constructor body, you can do uh, more sort of technical things. For instance, if you want to make sure that the ID is a proper value, for instance, if you want all of your IDs to be in the range between 1,000 and 2,000, you can check whether the initialized values are in the proper defined ranges because you might want more than just type defined checking you might want your own stringent checking on whether the incoming values are appropriate for the data that you're working with so this is what constructor bodies can be used for so so far we've covered quite a bit of ground with regards to what constructors can do why they're designed and what precisely happens when a constructor is invoked so uh, I'll see you in the next one when we talk a little bit more about um, the special cases such as references and member initialization lists on references.